Episode 2, Your Signature. The morning after a girl proclaiming herself to be the fictional hero of legend Lady Ardick arrived, it was proving to be as bizarre for Pierre as the day prior had been. Finding accommodation for the woman with the snow white hair and large brown eyes had been easy enough. Pierre's home in London was a large three-story townhouse with a whole array of rooms he seldom had use for, so finding an empty bedroom for the pretend Ardick had been an easy enough task. Further, he had instructed the housekeeper to leave the girl out a change of more contemporary clothes, as well as giving the man a small bonus to keep his mouth shut about Pierre suddenly keeping a woman on the property. Now he sat in the dining room on the bottom floor. It struck Pierre, what with his mind suddenly focused on his past life, that the dining room was itself easily larger than any of his old flats had been back in his youth. That wasn't to say he'd been poor before being so rudely dragged to earth. Indeed, as a knight in the service of D. Lady Ardick, he would have been privy to accommodation fit for a captain of the guard. And yet, it was only now, after all these years living in the oversized house, that he realised just how spacious the dining room by itself really was. Truth, the bottom floor of his current house was, without doubt, twice the size of the home he'd been born into. The whole house might well have been fit for a noble lord in the world Ardick came from. The exterior was a lavish wall of tall windows with interlinking exposed brickwork sections and fine work sandstone pillars that propped up quaint balconies on the second and third floors. The dining room was a long corridor shaped affair with a grand fireplace against the far wall. Said fireplace was decorated with expensive looking tools and trinkets from a great many cultures atop the mantel, alongside a fine layer of dust indicative towards a lack of use for the large hearth. The room was mostly filled with a large wooden table surrounded by twelve ornate chairs, each with fine ribbon inlays. The table was covered in lush doilies and ornate silver cutlery. Further, a small breakfast bar lay against the wall behind the table, lined with cereals, European pastries and burkas filled with tea and coffee. Pierre felt something akin to guilt run through him as he suddenly came to terms with the scale and lavishness of his home of so many years, compared with what he had left so unwillingly behind. He also felt something undeniably like annoyance at the woman sitting next to him. Beside the table being large enough for twelve, the girl calling herself Ardick had chosen to sit in the chair right next to Pierre. Not across from him or at the end of the table, but right next to him. Far too close for my liking, thank you very much. Her placement right next to him created an image of two people surrounded by a ring of empty seats. She was so close, in fact, that he could smell her scent. Of course, he did his best not to, and felt guilty for it, but he was only a man after all, he reasoned. And how was he meant to react to the faint floral fragrance of someone who'd never needed makeup in her whole life to be absolutely dazzling? Her scent especially stood out considering the rest of the room, had the faint musty smell one might find in cheap hotels or old B&Bs. The girl had chosen not to wear the clothes Pierre had ordered be left out for her, instead sticking to her original fantasy knight uniform, even the cape, claiming... The material of these garments was most strange, my good man, altogether too soft and coarse. I struggled to even sleep on that overstuffed mattress of your guest boudoir. Pierre hadn't argued this. He instead got a nostalgic moment of remembering his first time wearing earth clothes, and how strange their things had felt on him. A far cry from his current regime of slippered feet, warm cardigan and tin waistcoat, or his first night on earth spent in shop doorways or police custody cells because the beds of any hostile that would take him felt alien to the touch. And this? asked the soft but excitable voice belonging to the person Pierre was currently labelling, not Ardig, as she pointed towards a large bowl of porridge. Made from oats, I believe, Pierre said back. And that one? Wheat-based. And that one with the, um, the large orange and black menacingly grinning creature on the front? Pierre rose an eyebrow at this question, before realising the cartoon brand of cereal, not Ardick, had gestured towards, Hmm? Oh, yes, maize, barley, and far too much sugar. Probably best you avoid ones like that. Last thing I need is your medieval digestive system getting a massive sugar rush. Medieval? N never mind. Pierre sighed, this conversation on the various makeups of foodstuffs and other arbitrary items around the house had been going on for quite some time now unsurprising considering Ardick's medieval origins. Not Ardick, consider Pierre's responses for a few moments before asking her next query. But do you not find it strange, Jem? Pierre. What? Call me Pierre. 
Jim hasn't been my name for a very long time. And besides, if someone heard that a young woman was not only living in my house, but also had some sort of private pet name for me, well, the broadsheet newspapers would be all over it. I see, the young woman mused, clearly thrown off her stride. Speaking of which, wherever has that young butler gone? I called for him to bring me better clothes, but he did never return. Ah, so that's what all the shouting was earlier. He's no butler, he's a part-time housekeeper. He does an hour here in the morning and the evening. Luncheon I prepare for myself, Pierre added. Only two hours a day? But how can such a thing be possible? In a house as large as this, you must surely have a whole retinue of staff. Pierre sighed again. Nope. Two hours a day is more than enough for him to keep the parts of the house I use most tidy. The rest is of little confidence. You mentioned a guardsman just last night. Not a dick shot back. Pierre flushed a little with embarrassment. Ah, uh, well, yes, not exactly. The whole street pays a modest sum to have a man patrol the entire thing for a bit nightly. But he, um, is not exactly my guard. The girl's face turned to a broad grin, and she poked teasingly at Pierre's cheeks, causing them to redden even further. Oh, my old friend, it seems you have not changed as much as I thought. You were always one for the crafty plans. If one cannot afford a guard on every door, then one should spread rumours to the contrary. In spreading your mistruth, you deter the least determined of would-be cat purses with words alone, yes? And all without spending a penny on guards of your own. Pierre's blush grew even deeper. Well, yes, I suppose that's the gist of it, yes. <laughs> I see your cheeks also still shine when I tease you such. They, at least, have not forgotten who I am, she cooed, poking playfully. Pierre, for his part, stood up out of his chair, brushing away the woman's soft fingertips. He strode grumpily around the long table and stood by one of the large, paned windows, running his hand through the plump red curtains that adorned it. Not Ardick frowned at having her fun stopped, before turning her attentions back to the conversation at hand. So you have no guardsmen or servants here? None at all, Pierre said dryly, his eyes now fixed on the street outside the window. No spouse or child? No cousins or apprentices for your craft? No. But isn't that awfully lonely? The woman asked in all sincerity. Pierre's hand held frozen in the air before he coughed up a response. <laughs> Some people do not mind being alone, you know. Not Ardick frowned again, deeper this time. Uh, do you still not believe I am the woman you once knew, Pierre Havelock? It was his turn to frown back at her. I do not deny you in order to cause hurt. There are simply too many inconsistencies between you and the Lady Ardic I was acquainted with. In fact, I have been considering the possibility of a, a multiverse. You know, that perhaps you're some alternate version of Ardic from the whole other... He didn't get chance to go any further with his musings, as the silver glint of a sword coursed through the air towards his neck. Up to... It had happened in a single flush movement, almost too fast for the human eye. Alt Ardic, as Pierre was now considering addressing her, had launched from her chair, used the table as a stepping stone, sending a veritable collection of cutlery and condiments astrew, before drawing her sword in a single flourish. Said sword had gone straight through one of the red, heavy-set curtains Pierre had been admiring, cleaving the thing in half as Pierre stumbled backwards out of surprise, grabbing the slashed curtain to try and regain his balance, only to cause the remaining fabric to rip off the rails and fall lifelessly to the ground with a slick clicking sound. He wanted to ask what in God's name was going on, but he didn't get the chance. Altardic stamped forward twice in a fencing-style manoeuvre, a beaming grin cr across her ever-pretty face. Before he knew it, Pierre was swaying from side to side, the blade barely glancing his grey sideburns as he deftly, if a little clumsily, dodged the assault. This caused Ardick's smile to grow even larger. She ended her short assault in order to make up an expert stance, gleaming silver sword outstretched in one hand, the other held behind her back. She hopped lightly between her feet like some prized boxer might before a fight, her every movement light and controlled. What's that phrase? Move like a butterfly, sing like a bee? Well, this bee's sting is half a meter of cold, hard new steel, Pierre lamented internally, but this time he took action. Dashing behind himself, he grabbed up the fire poker from the mantelpiece. Like everything in the house, it was of an ornate but practical make. A long shaft of stainless steel with a heavy poker to one end and a small loop to the other. Placing his fingers through the loop, he managed to raise the awkwardly balanced staff, just in time to block a diagonal strike from his young friend's blade. Terrible clanging as the ad hoc weapon met with real craftsmanship. The hell are you doing, girl? Pierre uttered as he blocked a second slash and a third, a fourth, a fifth. The girl simply grinned evermore, a fire of excitement in her eyes. 
If she smiles any further, she'll run out of face. Altada continued to press her assaults, clattering down time and again against Pierre's fire poker as he desperately repelled each bro. Gradually they circled around the room, the girl sometimes jumping on chairs, throwing them or plain slashing the antique seats out of her way as she advanced forward with movements that seemed more fitted to a dancer than a fighter. It'd be beautiful if not so damn deadly. It is best to keep up, at one point risking a twirl manoeuvre, moving faster than he could remember in years as he spun the heavy end off the fire poker letting it fall to the ground and freeing up the rest of the shaft as a more usable tool. More and more dents formed along Pierre's pre end weapon, and he felt as though his lungs would give out and collapse at any moment from more exertion than he had been expected of him in literal decades. He didn't think of himself as an unfit man, but compared to a sword master and her prime of peak physical fitness, well, it was a contrast between them put lightly. Soon he realised that for all this to and froing, the girl was clearly holding back a great deal. Stainless steel or not, the fire poker could never survive long if she was serious. Indeed, Pierre even caught her turning the blade to its flats once or twice as the dance continued its course. Nonetheless, the sword flurry eventually hit with force enough to buckle over the poker with a sickening screech, before with one final clanging ring, the depleted utensil collapsed in half, the broken part launching aside by the force of the slash, before lodging itself in the wall next to Pierre, with the other half falling loosely from his hands rose her blade's tip to Pierre's heaving chest. And then she laughed, or maybe howled would have been a better word, sheathing her sword and gripping her sides as she nearly rolled around with laughter. Pierre also clutched his sides, mostly just trying to regrain his breathing. He grabbed one of the remaining upright chairs, few as they now were, and collapsed into it, sparing only the briefest of glances for his destroyed dining room. His heart was racing at a thousand miles an hour. His vision seemed almost blurry, he knew he was coated in sweat and his hands shook rapidly. As she was in the centre of his vision stood the culprit, laughing like a madman, her long silky hair swinging from side to side as she cackled, her voice as always soft but confident, a smile full of warmth brighter than any sun. What the heck was that for? Pierre stuttered through his panting. Ardig looked up, wiping a tear from her eyes and finally finishing her laughing spree. She moved back to the now messy table and leant against it. Hmm? Oh, you think you were the only one questioning the validity of the other's claim to identity? Why should I have believed you were my friend Jem so easily, any more than you should believe I am Ardic, yes? Pierre stared, bemused at her. But there must have been better ways, he exclaimed, finally getting his breathing back under control. I still have my sword, nearly sold it a few times. But I held on to it all this time as proof. I, I can show you that. Other things too. Lots of proof. The girl shook her head with a stern expression. And why do that? I've seen your collections of tat around this estate. Trinkets and toys, not relics. And of course your sword could be stolen or forged as a trick. No, my dear fellow, don't you see? The muscle memory of your body has not forgotten your style, my friend. Every strike and block you made is infinitely better than a signature written in mere pen and ink could ever be. Even with three decades of rust on you, she said with a loose wave of her hand in Pierre's direction. He just stared back blankly at her as she giggled at his expression. <laughs> there is no further questions to be had now. You are without doubt Jem Havner, the man who trained me in the ways of the sword all those years ago. And the one who was my sparring partner till, well, for me, just yesterday. Though I guess for you that was some time ago. Still, I could never forget your method. And what of you? Are you not now convinced by my sword form of who I am? Jem, or Pierre, paused for a moment before shaking his head. That style is definitely hers, but still. I'm sorry, but still no. Ardick's face fell to one of true hurt and sorrow for a moment, before brightening up again. Alas, then, very well. It was not a total failure, for I am now convinced of you, and that has given me all the more motivation to show you that I am most certainly the Lady Arctic, she said with the most ridiculous of grins once more plastered across her face. But for now, you may call me... Hmm... Call me Marka. Yes, Marka Umut. And I shall call you Pierre. That is, at least, until I convince you of who I really am. And trust me, Pierre, I will convince you. And like that, Pierre's bizarre breakfast the first he'd had alongside another human being for quite some years, ended.